Good morning to each of you. Another beautiful Sunday morning. This is truly the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know about you, but I am so glad to just be with you on another Sunday morning. Here it is, this last, this fifth Sunday in the month of August. Uh, I just made that statement so that you will know that yes, we are live since I'm coming from the house this morning. Uh, like many of you, I don't know, something happens when it rains that allows my body to just go into comatose. And so uh, I was able to sleep in with my lovely wife and then get up and have coffee and get everything set up to just uh, stream live here at the house this morning. But we have converted my office into a cathedral or into a sanctuary so that we could come to you and share with you a word from the Lord. I'm not going to delay in getting uh, to the word this morning uh, so that we can share a word with you and then a few announcements uh, for you. So we'll look to the Lord in a word of prayer and then we'll hear what the word of God has to say to speak to us out of encourage in order to encourage us uh, on this morning. Shall we pray? God, our Father in heaven, Lord, how we love you, how we thank you for allowing us to see a brand new day, God, a God that had not been promised to us. God, when we laid down last night, we did not know if our eyes would open up to see a brand new day. God, we didn't know if we would have strength, not just to wake up, but to even get up out of the bed and start a brand new day. And so, Lord, we thank you, God. Lord, we thank you for allowing angels to encamp around us, protecting us and keeping us safe from hurt, harm, and danger. God, when the death angel was standing at our door, you made him step back and behave. God, we have so much to be thankful for. God, how you have blessed us and how you've kept us and provided for us and sustained us, how you've healed our sick bodies. God, how you've made ways out of no <laughs> ways, how you paid bills that our money couldn't pay, how you put food on our table, clothes on our back, kept us on a job that was being laid off. God, how you've done so much for us. God, we couldn't tell it all. If we had 10,000 tongues, we couldn't say thank you enough. God, we would be remiss to not remember uh, the, those that are sick and shut in even now, God, that you would reach down and touch them and strengthen their bodies, heal them right where they are. God, we know that you are still in control in the midst of a pandemic, uh, in the midst of civil unrest. God, we, we know that you are still sovereign, that you're still in control, and that nothing happens without at least your permissive will. And so God, as you are at work behind the scenes, God, but orchestrating things in front of the scene, God, we ask that you would continue to be with us, be with your children, be with your church, God, that men and women may see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. God, I'm praying that you would bless the word that shall be preached and go forward to accomplish that which it was intended. God, that it would just be a word of encouragement to the discouraged. God, a word of hope to those that feel hopeless a word of salvation to those that are lost. God, we need you now to speak to our hearts and to our minds. Open us up so that we might hear you, that we might feel you. Move as only you're able to move, God. Have your way now, in Jesus' name, amen. There's a word for just a few moments I wanna share with you uh, from the Gospel of St. John, chapter eight, beginning at that, 12th verse or the 12th verse. That's the Gospel of St. John, uh, chapter 8 and verse 12. I want to share with you just a, uh, a few quick points out of and and I pray and hope that you will be blessed uh, out of it as well. Um, giving you time to find it. Listen, I, I realize what all has been transpiring in the world around us. Um, the unrest, especially there in Wisconsin, but we know that it's not contained there, but it's spilling all over the world. Uh, like many of you, I am just as frustrated, but I didn't prepare to speak on what was happening or going on simply because 
it would have been a message prepared out of emotion and frustration. But that's not the God that we serve. And so uh, I, I have to speak to what God is giving me to speak to uh, and bless where God is asking me to bless and, and offer a word of encouragement. But when God frees me up uh, to do so, we will do so. Um, but this morning, we're going to look at uh, John chapter 8, verse 12, where you'll find these words recorded. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. For a few moments, I want to talk to you from the thought of Jesus, the light of the world. By way of our text, John uh, reveals to us the very character of Jesus Christ. If you, if you look closely at the text, John said, then Jesus spoke again. He's, he's letting us know that this is a continuation of a previous conversation that Jesus was already engaged in. That, so if we're going to understand the text, we got to consider the context of the text. When you look back at chapter 7, uh, the Jews are celebrating the Feast of the Tabernacles. Uh, and during this feast, all Jews were required to return to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast. This, this feast, would, uh, would they would come together and they would remember and they would reflect and they would rejoice over the goodness and the faithfulness of God. They reflected by remembering how God kept them while they were wandering uh, in the wilderness, uh, how God provided for them, how in the midst of, uh, of the wilderness that, that God sustained them, he protected them. But then they also rejoiced by praising God for what he had done, for what he was in the midst of doing and what they expected him to do. And listen, it wasn't just the low and the poor that were praising God, but it was also the high and the high-minded and pious. Everybody laid aside their robes of pride and piety to lift the Lord. Don't miss that. It wasn't just the low, but it was even the high. It wasn't just the low class, but even the middle class and the high class, everybody laid aside their robes to worship and to celebrate what God had done for them, knowing that without God, nothing is possible. So the low praised God because they knew that they needed God. But watch this. The high praised God because they knew they needed God. I wish, I wish we would develop our faith so that we would praise God regardless of what our circumstances look like, regardless of our situation, the crisis, or contentment, that we would have an attitude of praise that says, I'm going to praise God no matter what, no matter if I'm up or if I'm down, whether I'm sick or if I'm doing all right, whether I'm high or if I'm low, if I got money in my pocket or if I'm flat broke, I will bless the Lord at all times. That's why so many people around us are living defeated lives. Uh, instead of reflecting on what God has done, they are too busy spending time reflecting on their problems, their pain, their plight, and even their prosperity, failing to realize that the same God that was able to do to bring me through back then is the same God, I wish I had a witness this morning, that is able to keep me right now. That if he did it back then, he's able to do it again. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. Anybody grateful and thankful this morning that you serve an omnipresent God? It doesn't mean just he's present in the now, but he's present in your past. He's present in your tomorrow. He's not bound by space or time. The reason why folks can't praise him now 
is because we have developed too many Christians that walk by sight instead of by faith. And the problem with that is too many folks are walking around aimlessly in spiritual darkness. That's why God can't bless your life because you're walking around in darkness. But watch what the text tells us that the Jews, they reflected and they rejoiced at the faithfulness of God and how God kept them in their wilderness wandering. This celebration during the Feast of Tabernacles, it included two ritualistic acts. The first act was that uh, water was to be drawn from the pool of Siloam by the priest to be poured out upon the altar. And then the other was that at night, after the sun had set, they had four large candelabras uh, that, that they would go and light. And the light from the candles off of the candelabras would uh, uh, emanate uh, and reflect off the limestone walls of the city. It was so bright that it made uh, night appear as bright as the day. And these ritual acts were symbolic of Moses, him striking the rock uh, and water flowing out of it while they were in the wilderness. And it represented the pillar of fire by night that God used to lead the children through the wilderness. And so, and so John using this, or Jesus using this as a backdrop, continues to teach those that had gathered to hear him as he revealed to them exactly who he is. When the feast concluded, uh, Jesus wants them to understand just because the light no longer uh, burns in the city at night, there is still a light, capital L, that can't be extinguished. Jesus, knowing their understanding of the symbolism of what the feast represented and what it meant and, and what the candelabras and the light represented, he used this time as an opportunity to introduce to the people listening his divine character. Don't miss that building off the symbolism of the light that, uh, that would cause the city to shine bright even at night, uses it as a symbol to introduce to them his divine character. He says to those that are anxiously waiting to hear him and to, uh, and to those that were his adversaries gathered around to collect dirt on him, he says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That brings us to the first point of this uh, small lesson that I want to pull out of the text that Jesus, he's the light of the world. But he, he makes a bold declarative statement in our text. He says, I am the light of the world. Everybody standing around listening understood what Jesus was saying. He, they understood the claim that Jesus is making when he says, I am the light of the world. They understood that Jesus was claiming to be God. In the Greek, that word, the word that Jesus used here for I am is the same words in the Hebrew language that God says to Moses when he tells Moses to go and tell Pharaoh that I said, let my people go. And Moses asked God, and when I come unto the children of Israel and I come to the elders and say to them that the God of your fathers had sent me to you, and they say to me, well, what's his name? What am I supposed to tell them? God said, listen, when they ask you that question, I want you to throw my card up on the table and tell them that I am, that I am sent you. And this is a word in its Hebrew etymology. It simply means Jehovah. That name or the name for Jehovah has no English word. Uh, it can be translated to because it's a verb. Don't miss this. Jehovah does not have a name or an English word that it can be translated to because it's a verb that is past, present, and future tense. 
all at the same time. It comes from the name of Yahweh, which means I am the God who has always been, who is, and will always be. In other words, he is the eternal, uncreated creator who created all things. But notice what his claim is, that he's the light of the world. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And I did a word study on this, and what I discovered is that the word for light used here refers to spiritual light. It doesn't refer to a, 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 a candle uh, or a physical light. It refers to a spiritual light. And the word for world, it does not represent or mean the physical planet that exists within a solar system or universal confines. But here's this. It means to take care of. It means uh, to provide for. It means to carry off uh, from home. So to better understand this, I had to use the law of first mention that brought me to the creation of the word uh, in Genesis, of, or to the world in Genesis. Genesis 1, 2, and 3 says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. The truth is, is that we live in a dark world. And that word darkness in the Bible uh, is an analogy for evil. It's a word for sin. It's not by chance that most crimes are done under the cover of darkness. In the darkness, people can go unseen and their acts can go uh, hidden in our in our world, our world is masked in spiritual darkness, and where there is spiritual darkness, evil and sin will flourish. People don't 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 obey God's commandments. They they're selfish in their actions. They harm one another, uh, even in the church, either physically or, or verbally, emotionally or mentally. Darkness exists in the world in which we live. The world all around us, you see evil is at work. Evil is moving uh, constantly and steadily around us. It exists in our community. It exists in our schools. It exists on our job. And the Bible says that it even exists in us. question is, why does darkness exist? You might be thinking darkness exists because it comes from Satan, and, and you would be partially correct. But darkness existed before Satan. Actually, darkness is the absence of light, and spiritual darkness is the absence of the presence of God. Let me try to make that make sense. A university professor challenged his students with this question, did God create everything that exists? And one student excited to answer this question threw up his hand and he answered, yes, he did. God created everything the, uh, the professor asked? Yes, sir. He certainly did, the, the student replied, the professor answered, if God created everything, then God created evil. And since evil exists, and according to the principle that our works define who we are, then we can assume that God is evil. The student got quiet and couldn't answer the, 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 the professor's hypothetical uh, question and definition, and the professor uh, pleased with himself, boasted of the students or to the students that he had proven once more that the Christian uh, faith was nothing but a farce and a myth. Another student raised his hand and said to the professor, may I ask you a question? Uh, of course, replied the professor. The student stood up and asked, professor, does cold exist? 
What kind of question is that? Of course coal exists. The uh, professor responded. He asked the, the question, have you ever been coal? And the other students started to laugh at the young man's question. The young man replied, in fact, sir, coal does not exist. According to the laws of physics that we consider coal is in reality the absence of heat. Everybody or object is susceptible to study when it has to or transmits energy and heat is what makes a body or matter uh, have or transmit energy. Absolute zero uh, minus 460 degree Fahrenheit is the total absence of heat. And all matter becomes inert and incapable of reaction of reaction at that temperature. He says, cold does not exist, sir, but we have created this word to describe how we feel when we have no heat. The student continued on. He asked the professor, does darkness exist? And the professor responded, of course darkness exists. And the student replied once again, sir, you are wrong. Darkness does not exist. Darkness is in reality, it's the absence of light. Light we can study, but we can't study darkness. In fact, we can use Newton's prism to break white light out into many colors and study the various wavelengths of every color. You cannot measure darkness. A simple ray of light can break into a world of darkness and illuminate the darkness that was around it. How can you know how dark a certain space is? You measure the amount of light present. Isn't this correct? Darkness is a term used by man to describe what happens when there is no light present. And finally, the young man asked the professor, he said, so sir, does evil exist? Now uncertain, the professor responds, of course. I've already told you that evil exists. We see it every day. It's in daily examples of man's inhumanity toward other men. It's in the multitude of crime and, and violence everywhere around us in the world. These manifestations are nothing but evil all around us. To this, the student spoke up and replied, Sir, evil does not exist, or at least it does not exist unto itself that evil simply is the absence of God. It's just like darkness and cold, a world, uh, a word that man has created to describe the absence of God. God did not create evil. Evil is just simply the result of what happens when man doesn't have God's love and presence in his heart. It's like the cold that comes when there is no heat or the darkness that comes when there is no light. That professor got quiet, students stopped laughing, and he sat down because he was baffled and befuddled by this young student in his class. That young student name was Albert Einstein. So without God's presence in our life, we're left in darkness. Why do we see murder all around us in the world? Why do we see racial uh, bigotry and racism uh, all around us? Why are we seeing the civil unrest that's happening all around us? Our community increasingly sucked into alcohol and drug abuse and moral sin. Why do hurt? Why do we see people hurting other people and making poor choices in their life? It's because of evilness. It's because we lack God's presence in our hearts, in our minds, in our life. We don't have God's light fully shining within us. Jesus is light that has come into a dark world. In order to see our lives change, in order to see the world change, it requires the light of Jesus shining in the dark corners of our life. Jesus wants us to live in that light. If we're going to walk in the light, then we have to receive the light that is Jesus Christ. That brings us up to our next point is that we have to receive the light. Later on, when we, by the time we get to uh, chapter 12, verse 
46, Jesus said, I am come uh, a light into the world that whosoever believeth in me should not abide in darkness. We have to let the light enter into every part of our being because light reveals darkness for what it truly is. When, when the light is shed into the darkness, we can see things as they truly are. Imagine your life is like a house at night with many rooms. Only the lights are shut off. You're in a pitch black room. And I believe that that's the picture that Jesus wants us to have of our life without him. That he is the light standing at the front door. He's knocking. He's asking for entrance. The Revelation 3 and 20 says, here I am. I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking so that you can let me in. And if any man hears my voice and opens up the door, then I'll come in and I'll sup with him and he with me. That when we invite Jesus into our lives, that when we trust him, when we put our faith in him, that we are opening up the door, that we're allowing his light to enter in and conquer the darkness that's on the inside of us. I got to warn you, that means that we take a high risk. Because when we let the light of Jesus in, his light will expose the darkest corners of where sin has been hiding in secret. Light has a way of exposing the dirt and the filth in our lives. Have you ever been to a bar during the day? I, 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 wrong crowd, wrong crowd. I know you've never been to a, a bar or a club or anything like that, but, but because of my job, my job, I have to go into these kind of places day and night. And, and I, I've gone at night. And when you go at night, you, you really can't see how dirty these places are. But because I've had to go to some of these same places for work, for work, for work that I've gone to at night during the day, and the light exposed just how nasty and filthy and dirty these places truly are. And when Jesus exposes the filth in our lives, then we have to recognize them and seek out his forgiveness in order to sweep them out of our lives, to sweep and clean up our own house. We might call this the salvation and sanctification experience. We were saved from eternal condemnation to eternal life with God, and it directs us to live and to look more like Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in Romans like this. He said, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm almost done here. That once you receive the light, you got to walk in the light. Ephesians 5 verses 8 and 11 says, 8 through 11 says, for though your hearts were once full of darkness, now you're full of light from the Lord and your actions should show it. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord and take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, rebuke and expose them. Jesus tells us that when we receive this light, it's not enough to have it and to put it under a bushel. But you got to walk in that light. 
Once we've allowed Jesus to go through and expose the dark areas of our lives and, and allow his light to shine, it's time that we start to walk in the light of the Lord. The Bible says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. The, the more we allow Christ in, the more light will shine through us. If we still have dark areas that are in our lives, that are in our heart, it's because we have not allowed the light of Christ to deal with it. The reason why we're still struggling with it is because we haven't turned it over to the Lord to allow the Lord to deal with it. And instead, we try to keep it hidden, those secret sins from the Lord. But here's the thing. He knows all. And he sees all. There is nothing that's hidden from the Lord that God can't see. Even your darkest and deepest thoughts, he sees those things. So there's no reason in trying to hide them from him. But go ahead and allow his light to expose them so that you can repent and be forgiven of them. So here's a question you ought to be asking. How do we walk in the light? I'm glad you asked. First John 5 and 7 says that God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. That if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, then we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. When we walk in the light, there are two things that ought to take place. The first thing is that we ought to have fellowship one with another. Those that live in the light have fellowship with other Christian believers. The reason why is because the light attracts of the light. We all live together in unity. We love one another. Uh, if we're not living in fellowship with each other, then we're not walking in the light that we are choosing to live in darkness. But then secondly, uh, we're purified from sin. That we live in a state of forgiveness. Those that walk in the light are continuously purified of their sin. This doesn't imply that we don't sin, that we we'll never sinned again. The following verse makes it clear that if we claim to have no sin, then we deceive ourselves. Rather, it implies that we are in a state of forgiveness, that we're covered and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. In 1 John 1 and 9, when John is writing to the church, he informs us, listen, you're going to mess up but because Jesus has died and paid for all of your transgressions and your sin, both past, present, and future, God has made it possible that if you just confess your sins, that God is faithful and just, and he'll forgive you of all your unrighteousness. It's not that you live a sinless life, but that you are in a state of, of constant forgiveness because when I mess up, I know that I can come to God and God will clean me up. Listen, I'm done. But I got to ask you this simple question. Have you received the light of Jesus into your life? Have you allowed the light of his love to come in and to fix you up and to cleanse you up and to lift you up? Are you walking in the light as he is the light? I remember growing up in that old church where the choir would sing, walk in the light, that beautiful light. Come where the dewdrops of mercy shine bright. Shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus is, Jesus is the light of the world. The psalmist says it like this, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes gathered around me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. 
Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this one thing will I be confident. The one thing that I have desired of the Lord, and that shall I seek after, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Listen, this is just a few words of encouragement that I, I wanted to share with you on this morning. That you don't have to walk in perpetual and continuous darkness. But Jesus is the light of the world. If you allow him to come in, he'll be your guide. He'll show you how to walk. He'll show you where to walk. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Allow him to light your pathway. Allow him to be the light of your life. To come in your heart. To warm you over. Expose darkness not just within us, but the darkness all around us. That we not walk down that wrong path. So if you haven't received Christ, if he is not the light of your life, you can make him that light right now by simply accepting him as your Lord. All you have to do, all you have to do is believe that God raised him from the dead and confess that with your mouth. The Bible says you're saved. The Bible says just that simply, as simply as the Lord will come in and be the light of your life, you can be saved just as simply. By making that statement of confession and believing that Jesus Christ is God's only son, died for you, paid out your debt to hell, got up again on that third day with all the power of heaven and earth in his hands. And if you're willing to do that right now, the Lord will come in and sup with you. You'll be indwelled by the very Spirit of God. And you'll be able to walk in that light. God bless you <coughs> is our prayer. But before we go, a couple of real quick announcements that I do want to make with you. Um, I sent out a, a mass text on yesterday. I hope and pray that uh, I sent it to all to everyone I have. Uh, and I, I hope and pray that you received it, that you've been prayerful about what I have asked uh, when it comes to the consideration of us returning back uh, to the church, whether it be in the sanctuary or in the courtyard. Uh, beginning tomorrow through Wednesday, I'm asking uh, for the church collectively uh, to go into fasting with me that will begin on tomorrow morning uh, at 6 and conclude at 6 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, I am seeking God's guidance uh, and God's face to direct us into what direction uh, that he would have us to go. Uh, not to rush in, uh, but to do things uh, according to how he would have us to do those things. And so I, I pray that, that you will uh, do just that with me. Uh, as I stated in, in that text, that, that throughout the Bible, when you look at Daniel, you look at Esther, look at Nehemiah, uh, and other uh, biblical or Christian leadership that called for a fasting, a communal fast, everybody, go and fast. I'm making that same call on this, on this morning, beginning tomorrow, through Wednesday, 6 p.m., that we will fast all together, seeking God's face for an answer on how and when to return. Um, so with that being said, also on next Sunday, the first Sunday, um, so that if we're not back, uh, go ahead and make sure that you have everything that you need uh, for your, um, uh, the elements partaking in the Lord's Supper. So get your cracker, your bread, your wafer, uh, your juice, uh, whatever it is that, that, you, that you're going to have as we come together uh, to receive the, the Lord's Supper together. That way, while I'm doing it, that you'll be able to continue to participate 
in doing that with us on next Sunday. Uh, when we look all around us, the world, the things that are going on, listen, change has to come. And it doesn't happen apart from your action. We have to be involved. We have to do something. And I mean beyond protesting, uh, beyond marching. We got to vote. We continue to pray. But we have to vote. You have to do your part. You have to fulfill your duty as a citizen of the United States in participating in this election. Listen, all the details that you need, you can go to vote.org. Uh, I was speaking earlier on last, this past week to Sister Lemon who gave me some information. So I went on and checked it out. There are some restrictions uh, to absentee voting. Uh, I know the president doesn't know the difference, but mail-in voting and absentee voting, same thing. There are some restrictions to those that you have to be 65 or older. Uh, you have to be disabled, out of the country, or confined in jail. If you don't meet those qualifications, you won't be able to do mail-in or absentee voting. So if your intention is to do the mail-in votes, go on and request, because you have to send in a request, go online, uh, and get the form that you need to send in for the request for the absentee uh, uh, voting. Go and do that immediately. You see the game that they're trying to play with the Postal Service uh, to try to block your vote? Don't wait till the last minute. Get it done and get it done now. Also, uh, make sure, go on to vote.org, make sure that you're registered to vote. You can go on there, it asks and goes so there has a link to click on to make sure that you're registered to vote. Make sure that your name has not been wiped from uh, 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 from the roll, from the registry. Go on and make sure that you're registered to vote. If not, get registered immediately. Check for your neighbor, check for anybody else that may not have access or ability to do so. Also, early voting, early voting, October 13th through October 20th. Don't wait till November. Let your voice be known early. Let, let our federal government know that we are tired and frustrated and we want to make a difference right now. Don't sit back and wait. Don't wait for the polls to come in and see what they say. Get out and beat the crowd. Go and early vote so that you can beat the crowd and not have to worry about the long lines because they are going to be long. They are going to be distanced because of the pandemic that we are in. And so get out early so that your vote can be counted. Lastly, um, the 2020 census. If you have not completed it, complete the 2020 census. The 2020 or the census it's only done every 10 years, and it's a way for you to be counted. I know how us is all. We don't like the man in our business, but this is so important. Have you ever wondered how suburban areas end up with as much money as they do federally versus urban areas who are packed full of people? It's because we don't take the time to fill out the census, which determines how the federal government distributes billions of dollars. These dollars that go to our communities that are important for our communities, for infrastructure, for schools, for books, for, li listen, we need to make sure that the dollars get back in our communities so that our people might have access or be able to benefit from those funds. Also, it's used to determine the number of seats uh, that each state gets in the House of Representatives. You wanna be represented? Stop always sitting back saying, it doesn't matter. My vote doesn't count. Listen. 
if we have the folk representing us that look like us, that are concerned about our community, that come from where we come from, that knows what we're going through, then we have to get them empowered and in position to make a difference. Complete the census, the census, because it helps to break out how many seats we have that represent us. So uh, I think that's it. I don't have anything else that, that I know of. Uh, lastly, I do, uh, it, we need to uh, also, uh, I almost forgot, and I'm Baptist. Uh, we want to encourage you right now uh, at the same time for your gift, your giving. Uh, there are two ways that we have to give through Givelify, uh, online through Givelify, or uh, you can bring your gift directly uh, to us. Bring it down next Saturday. It's the Saturday before uh, our first Sunday, so someone will be there. Um, Sister Howard will be there. Uh, I don't uh, have the time. I'll put it out. Normally, she's there from about like 10 to 12, uh, but she had her family crisis. Her nephew was uh, home going was this was uh, this week, and so I had had not checked with her in regards to uh, when she'll be available down there. But I will get that out to you uh, as soon as I can, and so that we can get the word out. Uh, if there is nothing else, uh, my prayer is that God will continue to be with you and keep you. That God will uh, protect you. That God will bless you. That God will provide for your every need. May the grace of God, sweet communion of his Holy Spirit, rest, rule, abide with you. Now, henceforth, and forever. Amen. God bless you. God keep you as operator.